topic here is uh, thinking ahead, and especially this notion of intelligent positioning, autonomous positioning in a sense. Um, can you all see the slides, or should we have the lights turned off? That's, I think that might be a little bit better. Um, okay, so let's just begin. The photonics industry is evolving very rapidly, and I personally believe it is important to understand where it is coming from, to understand where it is going, and how both photonics itself and the technologies that are being driven by it will have My company does. Uh, this isn't meant to be a commercial presentation, but there's a context that I think you will come to understand. We'll talk about some of the technologies that we are bringing to bear to improve the efficiency and to enable the manufacturing of photonic devices and others, as you will see. Let's talk about the problem statement that we're trying to solve, and that is basically that alignment. The necessity to bring photonic devices into takes a lot of time using traditional technologies. That is a problem that we are solving today. And then we'll talk about device trends and then we'll talk about what we hope can fix everything in terms of production economics and enabling new ideas. Okay, so let me show you what we are why we are here. It's really very simple. And I like to do this because it is, it's fun, and it's something I can share with my family, and that is, I will take a selfie. <laughs> okay, so what did I just do? I just drove many megabytes of driving the world today, the technology world in particular. Look at this. Here you have rich and famous people. Here you have people with nothing at all who just washed up on the shores of Europe or whatever. And they're both doing the same thing. They're taking a selfie, just like I did. And again, megabytes of data going up to the cloud and then to whatever other devices they might have, and to back up, and to their friends, and to their families, and to their colleagues. It metastasizes, and it is a very uh, important um, aspect that is driving photonics, and microelectronics, and data aggregation, and big data, and all of these things, and governments as well. Now, 2.4 billion selfies were uploaded, uploaded to Google Photos. Google Photos, one application, annually, connectivity required to support that one application. Two trillion labels applied that Google has to keep track of, so if you want to search for a keyword, it can find them. So almost all that data goes to the cloud. Almost all that data goes to and from the cloud multiple times. And this is a new phenomenon. We didn't take selfies 10 years ago. This is something that, that is brand new and, as you can see, universal. It means that we are in the everything digital era where our lives and this must be accommodated. And it's getting to be very expensive uh, because, uh, well, let's just consider the, the uh, history of photonic interconnects. They started in the early 1990s, not that long ago, to replace these satellite links that used to be used, used to be optical fibers, uh, which was about 30 years ago. Again, not long. And now it's all about the data center because this is the cloud. This is what the cloud looks like here. This is a data center with thousands and thousands of servers all connected together. So you can see the, from these transoceanic and transcontinental links, we have gone down to regions. It's being driven by capacity. It's being driven by speed. It's being driven by energy consumption because it turns out 
to convey a bit of data by charging a long wire and then discharging it. It's not the most efficient way of doing it. More than half of the energy consumed in computing, even with your computer, even with your cell phone, is in connectivity between the elements, between the cloud, between of Google searches that are done every year, you can see the problem. Now, photonics has been around for about 30 years, and it had a very good couple of years from 1997 to about 1990, pardon me, till about 2002. Era, it was all about replacing transoceanic, transcontinental links for telecommunications. One application. Today, there are so many applications. Selfies are one of them. But enjoying social networks, living our life in the cloud. I bought a book on Kindle yesterday on Amazon, downloaded to all my devices. Digital. It's all about the digital. And consequently, we're seeing this incredible uptake in um, demand for data services. Uh, the connectivity itself is improving in terms of speed because of the efforts of people like you. And the energy is improving, which is a good thing, because in the United States right now, about 8% of our electricity is consumed by data centers worldwide the data centers consume more energy than all of the United Kingdom. And this, I've seen some projections that by the year 2035, more than 100% of the world's electricity will be needed to drive data centers. And clearly, this is not a sustainable thing. So energy and the ability of technology to give you more throughput, more data, more capacity with less energy is absolutely critical for the future of our society as we become more digital. Okay, so a little bit about us. Again, not meant to be a commercial, uh, commercial presentation, but uh, this is what we do. This is, we are a company of about 1,500 employees. We are a global company, uh, about 200 million euros uh, global sales. We were founded almost 50 years ago. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary next year. Uh, this business of alignment, of bringing photonic devices into the correct orientation so that photons can, can move efficiently from one device to another. We have over 100 man years of experience in that field, that specialized field of technology within PI. So that's really what is our, is what we offer to the photonics world, is this expertise in making assembling, testing photonic devices efficiently and economically and quickly. Okay, so um, we are a positioning company. We make positioning systems. We started in the nano positioning world. We make our own piezo ceramics. We have, over the years, expanded to larger and larger mechanical systems. It's kind of the opposite transition that most of our competitors have taken where they started with large, sometimes rather crude motioning, motion systems and have attempted to move downstream into the world of higher precision over the years. So, a switch or a modulator, these all need to be assembled. And Alignment is repeated multiple points in the, in the manufacturing process. It starts at the wafer level with silicon photonics where you have a wafer with thousands of devices on it. Well, the real cost is in the packaging, so you want to be sure those devices work before they proceed into packaging. And that means testing at the wafer level. And then the wafer gets diced, the devices must be tested again because it's very easy to kill these devices. At every step they must be tested and alignment technologies were so slow. Time is money when you're doing manufacturing. Okay, so that means that alignment, because it is slow and because you need to do it multiple alignment challenge involves multiple degrees of freedom. Silicon photonics allows us to make array devices with multiple channels. 
So it's not just a matter of getting things facing each other accurately, they must also be oriented accurately as well. To rotate it to bring something into alignment or to bring the, the two arrays of your input device and your output device to bring them into correspondence so that they're coplanar. Are able to get the optical axis exactly on the same, uh, on, make a D alignment in X and Y. And traditionally, the only way to fix this has been either theta Z alignment, and then that's going to screw up X, Y again. So you have to go back and fix X, Y, and, and so you have this loop. It takes like this, this particular device here has two arrays being coupled to a chip. And sometimes these chips, the inputs and the outputs, interact with each other, which means you align the input, then you align the output, but that means you have to go back. Array devices is very strong. This is an array device made by Chiral Photonics in the United States little company in, in uh, New Jersey. And then people make chips that um, can take advantage of this very compressed uh, arrangement of channels. So that's wonderful. That's, that's an enabling technology, and that needs to be aligned, which is not an easy positioning. And PI makes positioners, instruments where you command a motion and they execute that motion. And that's what positioners do. They do what you tell them to do. You tell them to make a motion, they make that motion. How good do they do, do they do that? Well, that speaks to the grade of positioners. Maybe it's a nano positioners like ours, which means it's really obedient. It does exactly what you tell it to do. Maybe it's a coarser positioner that can, takes maybe uh, 10 or 50 microns of where you want it to be. It's a little bit less obedient, but to each other automatically. So the difference there is not just a positioner that does what you tell it to do, but a positioner that does what you want it to do. You don't just want it to move 10 microns. You want it to move to the point of optimum coupling. You see the difference. One is an obedient positioner. So the technical approach that we have taken with our alignment engines, our alignment positioners, Basically, two classes of functionality. First is what we call an area scan. It's exactly what it sounds. It's something that searches over an area until it finds a gradient search. That's an important concept. A gradient search is something, it's a, a, a function. You tell the positioner, find the maximum of this signal. And it climbs that mountain until it reaches the top. So it, it detects the gradient of the coupling cross-section of the profile, and it follows that gradient up until the gradient goes to zero, which is a definition of a peak. And one benefit of this type of technology is that it can track that peak. So if you turn on However, they can perform a alignment, a single alignment. They cannot perform multiple alignments all at once. At least this has not been something that has been available commercially. So our parallel gradient search is different from what has come before because it can perform simultaneous optimization across multiple inputs, multiple outputs, multiple degrees of freedom, all at once, multiple elements. So parallelism eliminates those lengthy repetitive loops. Instead of a loop that involves an XY alignment and a small theta Z motion over and over, you repeat over and over until you have the optimization you want. Instead, just a single step, do them both. Align the thing, align it in those degrees of freedom all at the same time, single step. So typically this approach has taken about two minutes. This approach, typically about one second. That's a factor of about 100 faster. So you can imagine if you go to a, if you design a photonic device and you want to be ensured that it's manufacturable, 
well, here's the key. You and your manufacturing partners can leverage this parallel technology to reduce the, the single largest cost in manufacturing your device by a factor of 100. It's not a small amount. Of, uh, one of our customers, it's a, the rare customer that allows us to talk about what they do. This is a company called Form Factor. Most people know them by their Cascade wafer probers. Wafer probers are the instruments that are used to verify the health of the devices on the wafer before anything else happens to them, packaging or testing, whatever. So here you can see they've taken one of our me mechanisms called a hexapod, which is a six degree of freedom positioner, very stiff, very I want you to rotate about that point in space. Now remember the, the array alignment technology? Well, you want to be able to rotate someplace close to that optical axis to minimize the parasitic motions in X and Y. Every time you make a theta Z motion, this, this will minimize the XY misalignment that occurs. So Cascade is using it right here uh, to rotate about a fiber tip. So. We have implemented this across a very broad array of uh, motion devices, ranging from the hexapods I just mentioned to our nano, what they need to do. Save them the most money in their production. The optimization technologies I've described look like this. Um, here's the basic challenge, the basic um, problem statement. You have a coupling the result of the positional orientation of two or more devices. And then there is typically several search and area. So perform a spiral. There are several interesting things about this implementation. First, you notice it ended up in between the scan lines. You can tell the controller, perform a scan, and then go to the observed maximum or go to a calculated maximum. And so it can see between the lines, which means the scan is even faster. How fast? Typically, it's about this fast. Typically, a few hundred milliseconds to perform that area scan and find and identify the global maximum. We can also calculate the centroid. If you have our systems can calculate the center of that top hat, which is where you want the alignment to, to end up. So that's the area scan. The other approach is gradient search, where we perform a small circular motion and follow the gradient up to the top of the mountain. And again, that was the slow, um, slow version of what actually happens. It's actually more like this. Again, a few hundred milliseconds to perform the alignment. And again, this At this point in the dither, which is what this is called, at this point in the dither, we have this much coupling. At this point, we have this much coupling. So you can see as we go around this circle, we modulate the coupling with a quasi-sinusoidal modulation at the frequency of that, of that dither. Our controllers automatically detect that modulation. The difference between the gradient searches that I was working with in 1987, 1990, and this new gradient search is the difference between this and this. Not only are the alignments much faster, but we can do more of them. So the overall throughput is much, much higher. So here's the chiral photonics device again. And again, I'm using this example of the alignment loop that you need to perform to device it tells you the scale. This one, I believe, has, is the one that I was using in this demonstration, which was at Photonics West. There are 61. I think up to 90 some odd channels with their current technology. And this is the fiber. This is about 250 microns wide. So very compact, 10 to 40 microns of spacing between the, uh, the array elements. 
So, three photonics wests ago, we showed this for the first time, where we and X and Y, we do the gradient search in theta Z and we're done. So in a second or two, we've done what would formerly take several minutes. And people thought we were faking it. I had one guy say, oh, well, this is nice, but how, what does it look like when it's really working? And I said, here, watch. I will push on this with my thumb and you can watch and see how this aligns into a different place because it's doing live alignments. People really thought it was impossible. So the next year, two photonics wests ago, we did this with an input-output array of glass fibers, where again, area scan on one side, area scan on the other, gradient search in parallel on both sides. You see this exact demonstration, because again, it's something people need to do. If you have an input-output device, you need to optimize the inputs and the outputs in multiple degrees of freedom. Notice, there are twice as many alignments being performed in this demonstration than in that first video. But it takes about the same amount of time because it's being done in parallel. So one interesting thing about this technology is the overall time of alignment is almost independent of the number of alignments. This is it, Photonics West, a this high most recent one. Interconnect. That is pioneered by a company called Chiral Photonics in New Jersey. In this very, very slender uh, probe, there are up to 91 individual single mode channels that can be used to connect to a very high density photonic chip. So actually what we're showing here is the ability to align and automatically track so that was the Chiral Photonics multi-core fiber device. Um, okay, here's an input-output device. Done. 300 milliseconds to align both sides and achieve a consensus optimum on both sides of a waveguide device. So you can see why the wafer prober people like to use this technology. Form factor. Just named one of the 100 fastest growing So here you can see the prober with, in this case, it's a fiber probes, but could be a race as well. And there is their, their message. Again, it's all about speed. Fast, fast, fast. That's the most important message for the photonics production industry today. Impressed URL here for you go to tinyurl.com new dash ff dash video it will bring this up this is an excerpt from it it's a little bit longer than this on youtube but you can see they're leveraging the, the settable pivot point the rotational center point so that they can move and characterize and align to devices on the wafer in multiple degrees of freedom Typical wafer prober sits next to two or more racks of instruments that perform metrology on the devices, sometimes at different temperatures and whatever the engineers need to review to, uh, to ensure their products do what people want to do. At the other end of the spectrum are the research applications driven by people like you. Here's one of my favorites. This was. Uh, little project I had with Purdue University. Defect in diamond, called color centers. They're the same uh, characteristics of diamonds that give some diamonds some color. They, there are uh, defects in the carbon lattice uh, where the carbon is replaced by something else, such as perhaps nitrogen or uh, different types of silicons, another one. Nitrogen vacancies in particular have some very uh, useful quantum characteristics. They emit photons that are completely uncorrelated, totally randomized, which is a useful quantum uh, property right there. They There's a laser that illuminates the diamond and causes the 
uh, the color centers to fluoresce, for lack of a better word. So let's say you're interested in this particular um, emitter. This blue square is an area scan. It's a large area scan, tens of microns. It scans that area, presents the results on the screen, and you can then click on an area or an emitter of interest. So part of this slide is, one, it's really cool. Two, it shows you the kind of precision that this basic technology can do and how future-proof it is as devices become more sophisticated. Okay, so you saw this slide before. I described how the circular dither causes a modulation of the uh, figure of merit, which for photonics devices is usually optical power. And the optical power as a function of position is typically a Gaussian or something similar to it. Well, the interesting thing is the contrast of a camera, the modulation transfer function, looks like as a function of misalignment of the devices, the elements in the camera lens. And that takes me back to my selfie. Two billion cameras are manufactured every year for smartphones. And they get better every year with more elements and higher resolutions and more precision. And right now, they've been using PI hexapods to uh, assemble these cameras for years. It's, it's a huge business for us. But with this new technology, you can take that figure of merit and feed it to the controller, and it will optimize the orientation of lenses with respect to each other in one step. So what that means is the way things are done now. is so much faster, though. You have the same setup, but you could just optimize everything at once. Now, we're in the early phases of this, um, but you can see in this next slide here, um, this is a video of the first proof of principle setup of this course, where we had two lenses, a contrast uh, target, a camera, that's a smartphone camera chip right there. And then over here, this is from the day we set up our demonstration at the Laser World of Technology Conference in Munich just last month. And so you can see sort of different parts of the alignment spectrum here. Here we have this large gantry robot with a couple of hexapods and some of our nano pos positioners called nanocubes doing alignments of input-output devices, array devices in multi so, what we're learning is even the most exotic technology like quantum, eventually you need to apply it. It needs to be practically implemented at a cost that people can afford. To be applied, it has to be manufactured. There is now a solution, a new solution, didn't exist before, to address the most significant cost in producing these devices, the photonics devices and many others. Have you ever considered why does a good microscope objective cost 20,000 euros? It's because of all the alignments required in order to, to get those lenses uh, exactly as they should be. The way it's done in that case is they take a very precisely machined metal ring and then they take the in each lens and they put the ring in a fixture very precise fixture in a white light interferometer. They bring the lens in, they orient the lens until it's just right according to the white light interferometer. And then they bond it into place so that it is oriented with respect to that mechanical ring. And then they take that lens and they do the same thing with all the other lenses. Why not do this instead? Why not change the packaging a bit so that the, you eliminate those rings use the, uh, make, make the individual lenses accessible and align them using this micro-robotic technology. It could reduce the costs, at least the cost, maybe not the price, but the costs of microscope objectives significantly. So there's lots of things that could be done about this, with this technology. That you want to see go into production someday speed the path to market. And it also means throughout my career in alignment for 30 years, people have been chasing the unicorn 
of passive alignment. Passive alignment means you can just put things together and they, they click into place and they're exactly where they should be. But that means all the pieces need to be machined and manufactured and produced to the tolerances we're talking about here. And that's very expensive. It was also very necessary. I mean, people were, have, been chew, uh, have been pursuing this unicorn for all these years because the alternative was so expensive. But now, if you could... Plus, there are things like wafer probing that you'll never be able to do passively. Okay, so it improves process economics, which I would expect would have a feedback approach to make research funding all the more attractive for the people who want to sell those devices to their customers. Okay, so PI is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary as a company. We are a very active member of the European Photonics Industry Con Consortium, EPIC. If you don't know about EPIC, I suggest you learn about it. It's a wonderful organization. Uh, it's for high-end networking, and they're very supportive of research. Despite the Europe in their name, they are a global organization. They participate in conferences. They're about to have a delegation here in Singapore, I believe, in October and get to know them. Highly recommend it. Great group of people. We will be hosting an epic event a year from now in October to celebrate our 50th anniversary with, uh, with our colleagues throughout the consortium. You're invited. Okay, so last slide. Um, I hope we can connect. Uh, I'm on both WeChat and LinkedIn, and of course you can always reach me by, by email. Um, want to know what your challenges are, what you do to relay to me.